pipe. What this allows you to do is push content from 3D Max right into UV layout created by Hedis and then send it right back into 3D Max. It's a very, very fast pipeline. It, if you've ever used ZBrush, the Go Z functionality, that's effectively what this allows you to do, but with UV layout. So if you've never heard of UV layout, let's just quickly go over here, go to the website, and here we are. I'm gonna have this in a document, so don't worry about jotting it down, or you can just go to www.uvlayout.com. But I'm not even joking, this banner, does it justice it does in fact take an object or your unwrapping process from an hour's worth of processing time down to minutes and i'm going to show you that in this video and furthermore if you go to their forum this is where you find all these free plugins um this is effectively the same thing i showed you in 3d max it's plugins that allow you to send from moto to uv layout cinema 4d maya zbrush it, soft homage. Unfortunately, that's not around anymore, but it allows you to send your models right from your modeling package into UV layout. It doesn't get any easier than that. And with that said, I'm going to show you right now how easy it is to use. So first off, we need some objects to unwrap. I'm going to go to full screen mode. Uh, let's create a box real fast. Let's go ahead, create a sphere, cylinder, there we go, and the last one's gonna be a torus. There we go, a couple of objects, nice and pretty, laid out fine. Finally, let's go to text tools. Showed you this in the previous lesson, and we're gonna grab all these objects, hit checker, throws the material on it very quickly so we can just see what the resolutions are. Um, and now we're gonna to go to the bridge tool, UV pipe. Um, this only works on poly objects, so the first thing we need to do to all this to send it to UV layout is convert to poly. Um, you have the option of sending to UV set 1, 2, or 3, very useful. You have the option of creating new UVs or editing pre-existing ones, but we're just going to create new ones just for this tutorial. And I'm going to make sure everything's selected and hit send and watch this. In seconds, I have everything in UV layout ready to be unwrapped. So basic navigation UV layout, hold down alt, left mouse button allows you to rotate, middle mouse button allows you to pan, and right, zoom. So you have to hold down alt the entire time to do all these functions, but it's very simple. Next, spacebar. Hold down spacebar, middle mouse button allows you to organize your objects in 3D space. And I think I'm gonna start off with this cylinder and let's unwrap it. So first thing, G. G allows you to effectively do what they call grouping our object or face. And I've just marked this and now if I hit enter, I've detached that geo from this object. If I hit D, it drops it to my UV canvas and effectively I just unwrap that object. Now I'm gonna go to the bottom of this. G, enter, D. Now if I wanna fix this edge right here so I can unwrap it, I hit C for cut and it just cut all the way down that object. And now if I hit enter, it breaks that edge and this object is ready to be dropped, D. Next, let's go to the torus. And I'm gonna do cut again. That grabs a loop all the way around this object and maybe I decided I don't want it there. I wanna have one edge down. You hit W to reverse that or do a weld to that. And now let's do a cut now to this section. There we go, grab that loop all the way around my object. Hit uh, C again, grab this loop all the way around, and miss that section. Let's just hit uh, C one more time, and now hit Enter. There we go. I think that torus is ready to be dropped. Hit D to drop. Next, let's go to the cube. All right, um, I could approach this many different ways, but I think what I'm gonna do is just cut this edge, this edge, um, that edge, this edge, let's see, and I think I'm gonna have to do one, two, and three. There we go, let's try that out. Let's hit enter, and I've effectively just cut that cube up, and it's ready to be dropped. Now going to the sphere. I'm going by this pretty fast because, once again, I can, and it's gonna make more sense when I go to the UV mode, but here we are. Uh, I'm just going to cut this sphere right down the center for this one. And I'm going to show you something once we get to the UV mode. Hit enter, D to drop, and uh, now effectively it just went to, if you were to hit three on your keyboard, it's showing you the results of your unwrap. And yeah, now watch this. If I hit one, I'm in UV mode. 
super fast. Now this is effectively my UVs. It looks like 3D Geo because it's being shaded that way, but this is actually my UVs of my object. So now if I hit F, it does a pelt flatten. Hit F, does a pelt flatten. Now I'm going to do F again on this, and that did a pretty good job. I mean, those are all perfect squares. If it didn't actually do that well of a job, what I could have done is hit R, and it does, forcefully does a uh, rectangulate to my object. It forces all the squares to be squares. Unfortunately, this only works with quads, so if you come across triangles, it's not going to have this predictability. So just remember, work with quads as much as possible. And as you can see, this is my torus. It looks like I've messed up one of the edges here, but let's fix that. So I'm going to hit F, and ooh, look at that. That's a mess. Now I'm going to do Shift F, and that does a force pelt. And you can see how it's trying to unwrap all this stuff. There's like some distortion. Now if I hold release that, and then uh, it's fighting, it's fighting. It doesn't can't quite get there. So to fix this, I'm going to actually have to send it back to edit mode. And the way you do that is Shift D, and it reverts it back to edit mode. I'm going to hit 2 to fix it. And now I'm going to hit Shift D again, and I'm just going to redo this because I apparently messed up on the back side of this thing. So I'm going to do Shift C, Shift C, rotate around the object, and there we go. I think it's fixed. Hit Enter, D to drop it, and I'm going to hit 1 again, back to UV mode. Artists don't script. Well, that can be true. Um, I wouldn't say what I do is scripting per se. I would say it's actually more like kit bashing code, exposing functions that already exist in 3D Max, reformatting it in what I would call a sequence or an, a playable action. So every time I hit a button, it ends up going through a series of steps that I do on a day-to-day -day basis to fix a common problem. So for instance, if I'm exporting into Unity, I need my object to be in a very specific place. I need the rotation of my transform to be Y up Z forward because that's the orientation of Unity. Well, you can do that very simply just by kit bashing code. I'm going to show you how to do that. All right, so let's start this off. I'm going to go to my Create tab, do Create Sphere, drag that out here, and I'm going to change my toggle real fast just so I can move this object up in space. And here we go. We have a sphere created. Well, I'm going to do affect uh, my pivot again. I'm going to move this pivot off into space and rotate that. And then I'm going to do affect pivot again. So now if I hit W on my keyboard and you have to make sure you're in local, this is actually the local pivot of my object. Normally you're uh, on view and this is useful because it ends up moving your object based off your, your uh, viewport and provided it actually takes, there we go. Um, this is world orientation. This is normally how you work with things. Well, when it goes into Unity, it effectively uses the object's local orientation. So this would be wrong. If I were to move my object, it'd be moving in space based off this X. I don't want that. How do I fix that? Well, the only way in 3D Max, for an artist at least, to fix that is I'd have to go to my hierarchy, do effect pivot, center the pivot to the object. So now it's roughly in the right spot. And then I'd have to do uh, go to my utilities, hit a reset X form, and then reset selected. Now it's effectively fixed. We have this reset X form, it's fixed. Well, at this point, I then need to collapse the stack by converting it to a poly. And now I have an object with a pivot in the center of the object. Those are a series of steps that you can script. There's no reason you should have to go through that four or five step process to create that single action. That's what I'm getting at. I'm going to expose some code, some parameters, and show you how easy it is to reformat the code for your needs. How do you do that? Let's go to Customize, Customize User Interface. It takes a few seconds to load up, and then here we go. We have this toolbar. I'm going to change this to All Commands, and here we go. Well, the first thing we need to do is we need to create a toolbar. So I'm going to open this up. I'm going to call it Steve's underscore demo. We're going to hit OK. It says I already have something that represents this. It's a, I needed a unique name. So because I already have a Steve's demo, let's click on that. It's an empty tab. There we go. And now I'm going to go through here and I'm going to hit C for center. I'm going to scroll down until I see center pivot. There we go. I'm going to drag that to my toolbar. I have center pivot now. And I'm going to drag this open. There we go. And now, so every time I move my object's pivot, I need a fix. I can hit center pivot. It centers the pivot. Now, what's the next thing? Well, let's do reset X form. I'm going to do R-E-S. 
And here we go, reset X form. I'm going to drag that over to my toolbar. And now, if I control Z this, if I hit reset X form, it's going to reset the X forms, fixes the orientation, and I can center the pivot. So I've just already saved myself quite a few steps. I'm not going, digging through these tabs to do this action anymore. I have them exposed in this format. Well, there's actually one more step you can do to make this even faster, making it into an action per se. So let's right click on this, edit macro script. First thing I'm gonna do is, I'm gonna do file new. And so this is gonna be the only small portion of code that you're gonna end up needing. And if you just reuse what I'm gonna show you, you can make all these variations very quickly. So don't be daunted, don't get frightened away because we're about to start typing things out. This is very simple. So what I'm gonna type out is macro script. And now I'm going to effectively give this script a name. What is this going to do? Well, I'm gonna call this center pivot reset X form demo. And I'm gonna do space. I want this to actually show up in my toolbar under a certain category, so I have to give it a category name. So now I'm gonna do category colon quotes where do I wanna have this live? Well, I'm gonna call it Steve's. So I have to delete that. I actually need to do quotes here. Steve's underscore demo. And let's call 01 for right now. So, so I have a unique category. I'm gonna put a end quote there, hit enter. And now if you wanna do this, uh, all you have to do is hit tab, tool tips. There we go and colon, quotes, uh, this is, uh, what, what are we gonna call this? So every time you hover over the button, it's gonna give you a specific name. We're gonna call this uh, demo underscore or 01, quote. Now here comes the coding per se, or kit bashing code. I'm gonna hit enter twice, hit backspace. There we go, I'm gonna do open bracket, hit enter, hit tab. Just This just allows me to organize this stuff in a very pleasing manner. So before I went in here, I actually exposed this object's code by right-clicking on it, hit edit macro script. Well, now if I go up here, and I scroll down, here's the macro script for center pivot. And this is the category. So if I go back to my script and I type in macro run, and then I do the category this object's in. So in this case, polytools, I'm going to copy that paste that in, do another space. I'm gonna do now do quotes. And now if I grab the object's name or the script's name, paste that in there, and that with quotes, effectively I'm saying run this script, it lives under poly tools, and the script is called center pivot. I've effectively just exposed that. Now I'm gonna hit tab again. I'm gonna type in macros run again. Quote. Now I'm gonna put in reset X form. I'm gonna edit the macro script, hit okay. Scroll down to reset X form. And once again, I have poly tools. This happens to be in the same category, which is very useful. Paste that in there. There we go. And finally, uh, reset X form. And let's just double check that that's correct. Back here. Reset X form. And I'm pretty sure I have that right. Oh, I forgot the E. I get rid of that space, and there we go. And enter, backspace, close the bracket. I've effectively just created a script, but now I need to save it. So first thing I'm gonna do is file save as. I'm gonna call it, let me just pull this down just to keep the names consistent. Steve's demo 01, is that what we had here? I believe that's what it was. So we're gonna call it Steve's underscore demo underscore 01. And then I'm gonna do dot, and this is important if you want this uh, to work correctly, macro. So now if I go back over here, scroll down to Steve's, oh, scroll down a little bit further, do, 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 do. and it's not exposed. That's because I have to actually restart max. Um, for this quick demo though, what I can do is I can just select both of these, drag this over to my toolbar, 
And now I effectively do have a script that's usable at this point. So the first thing I'm going to do is right click on the object, effect pivot, pull this over, rotate it. I'm just going to make it look horrible. There we go. And now watch this. I hit this button. It resets X form. It fixes my pivot orientation and this object's ready to be exported. That's how simple this is. If you actually want this to show up in the correct category, like I have listed here, you have to restart max. And then once you restart under categories, you're going to see Steve's demo as one of your options here. But the next thing we're going to be talking about is naming conventions. And don't worry, we're going to be going over scripting a little bit more in depth. I'm going to be exposing some of the scripts I've provided for Camouflage Game Studios in later episodes. So rest assured, scripting is easy. Kit bashing is even easier. So with that said, I wonder if you're creating content on your own or for a AAA studio, you should have a naming convention implemented. And if you're working for a studio that does not, convince them that you need to because one, it's going to save you money. Two, it's going to make your job as an environment artist so much easier because you're going to be able to find content faster and quicker. There's going to be consistency to the way things are created. So establish a naming convention. What is a naming convention? Well, let's just go right down here and open up this document. Here we have a document that was created by one of our environment artists, Jeremy Romanowski. Very talented artist, very talented at creating documentation that's digestible by everyone in our studio. Check him out. He does great work and he always likes LinkedIn requests. So with that said, let's look at his documentation. He denotes in this documentation that we have two architectural types. We have metamorphosis. This is a uh, broke Art Nouveau kind of architecture. And then we have intelligentsia. I think modern day sci-fi, it's kind of a hodgepodge of those two collaborating together. Well, in my directory structure, the naming conventions I would establish, if I was making a metamorphosis object, I would pref <laughs> denote that object with met, meaning metamorphosis, and then I'd give some descripting terms of what that is. So in this case, or this example, we have wall 801. So this denotes that I have a metamorphosis wall, and I have one variation, meaning A. If I had uh, another variation of this object, same geo, different material, I called met wall B01, C01, D01, and so on. The reason I don't actually use the number variable as denoting uh, the variations is because it doesn't work with our scripts. So if I create a scene and I'm duping this geo throughout the scene, you're going to see this number constantly changing, even though it's exactly the same content. What will not change is the A, the B, the alphabetical value. That's why you never use these numbers to denote change. So that's just a brief overview of how to create a name convention for your object. Well, you carry that through from start to finish. So if I call my object metwall A01, the material would be metwall A01. And if I needed a dark version of that, I'd call the material met wall A01 dark. And then the same thing goes with the textures. It'd be met wall A01 diffuse, norm, spec. And if I have a dark variation of that, it'd just be met wall A01 dark, diffuse, norm, spec, and so on. So let's actually look at some content that one of our environment artists, Sean Montepleasure, has created. Once again, I'll give him a plug. And this is just some of his work. He has a lot of very convincing artwork. He's a talented artist. He can do concepts. He can create models, textures, you name it. Very talented artist. All right, well, let's look at his scene. We have in this scene, int planter cap A01. This denotes that this is a planter. This is an end cap for this prefab set. And this is variation A, meaning the first variation. Here we have planter straight A01. Well, what this looks straight to, what's the difference? Well, the difference here is he's actually denoted that this is straight tall. So you're giving some descriptive terms to denote the fact that there are slight changes in the geo. This is very important. If I want to go in there and I want to find a curve piece and I just want to be able to look at the names and not have to cycle through all the geo, I can just very quickly look at the name, plant or curve, and I know immediately, oh, this is a curve piece. I can use it with this set in this location of my, my world building. That's why you have naming conventions. It speeds up your workflow, gives you consistency, and you will not have duped content. Well, what next? Well, if I open up my materials, let's look at that real fast. We have int planter A01. What do you know? It's very similar to the names we have here. It's a little generic. The reason it's generic is because these aren't hero assets. 
We don't need to have a unique name for each one of these planners because the, each one of these planner segments are using the same textures for efficiency and to reduce memory. Once again, I click on this one. We have int LED panning A01, a generic name once again. And the reason this doesn't have planner in it is because this is originally created for other areas of the world, but we're repurposing it for the planners because it makes sense. So he was able to do this because, once again, we had a naming convention that he could very quickly find this content. So he just typed in int, probably typed in panning, and then he found this texture. He's like, oh, wow, I have access to this. I don't have to create this from scratch. That's why you have naming conventions. And I feel like I'm beating you over the head, but this is very important. This might be one of the most important things that you can do for your artwork to speed up your content creation, just from an organizational standpoint. Now, let's bring this into Unity and see what happens. I'm going to select everything, do export, export selected, and I'm going to drop it into the int uh, underscore planter underscore A01 because this is the first planner FBX I've created. I'm going to export it into Unity. I'm going to turn on tangents by normals, smoothing groups, turn off turbo smooth, um, convert dummies to bones. I don't have any of those, so I'm just going to check that. And then we go to animation, don't need any of that. Cameras, I don't need that. Lights, don't have any of them. Embedded media, I don't want to embed any of the media. This is very important. My scale factor is one. I have max set up into meters. I'm exporting to Unity, which uses meters, so this is correct. And then finally, I have to make sure my axis conversion is Y up Z forward, because that's what Unity uses. Next, I hit OK. It exports it into Unity. Let's go down here, open up Unity now. Takes a few seconds to import, and then here we go. Here's that FBX that we just imported. If I go to my Windows tab and go to Inspector, we now see very quickly that I have all these assets. And look at that. They already have textures applied to them. Materials are already applied. The reason that is, is we had a technical artist go through, and he created a script that says, on import, do a name association. If there's a material that currently exists in our pipeline, and the FBX that's imported has the same naming convention, apply that material on import. That's a huge savings. Otherwise, I'd have to bring in the FBX, do all this material association, and it would take forever. You end up losing hundreds of man hours by doing that. So once again, this is a very script scriptable uh, approach, and you can do this. There's no reason not to. It saves you time and money. So once again, I change my scale factor to one because I'm doing a one-to-one -one translation. Max is in Maya. Unity is in, is in meters, and I hit apply. So now I click in here, click on my object, and there we go. All this stuff is set up, ready to be brought into my scene. There we go. And here we have a bunch of assets. Here's my FBX, and here's all that content. Well, watch this. Because I've actually gone through the trouble of establishing a naming convention, I can go to the tools. These are tools are created by one of our technical artists, once again. And now I'm going to select all of this content right here. And I'm going to say create prefabs from selection. It says I'm going to create prefabs and it's going to create 11 objects. I hit the create tab and watch over here. It's actually going to take all this geo, all the material associations, and immediately turn it into prefabs for me. I didn't have to do any of this work. This is done for me because I had a consistent naming convention. I named all my materials appropriately, all my textures appropriately, and it just assigns all this stuff on the fly. You're saving hundreds of man hours. I can't like state this enough. This is crucial. If you want to be a successful indie developer, you can't be wasting money, and this is one of the ways you can save revenue. Don't have people worrying about managing content. Have a directory structure. Have a naming convention everyone can implement. So over here, once again, I have Intelligentsia directory. I have a walls directory. I have my int planter, A01. That's where all my content is. If I go up here and type in int, and then I say filter through my assets, I want to find all the prefabs that are Intelligentsia. I can very quickly see all the content that is Intelligentsia right here. And I can drag that into my scene, start world building with these assets because I know exactly where they are. That's why you have naming conventions. So with that said, our next video is going to be talking about the importance of establishing scale standards for your assets and what that means in association with texel density. Before you start texturing it for texel density. Well, for instance, if I have this camera right here that I've created, I've modeled, I've textured, and I've based my texel density based off of this scale I currently have, 
when I get that object in the game, and it has to be the right size in relationship to the character that has to interact with it, that means I have way too much resolution associated with this asset. I mean, having decent resolution is important. Authoring your textures is almost done exclusively at double the resolution, if not triple. But the important thing to take from that is you always clamp your textures by the time it hits engine. Otherwise, you're paying this tremendous memory cost for an asset that is only a few pixels on screen. You don't want to do that. You want to be efficient. You want to be deliberate about your actions. Make sure you're paying attention to how large your object is before you texture it. So, for instance, if I go to my scale right now, this object, when we first saw it, was huge. And I've scaled it down to what I feel is the correct size, and now it's 20% of what it used to be. That, that's huge. So let's go ahead and reset transforms and f keep the pivot location, and let's see what happens when I run text tools on this object. Let's figure out exactly what size this texture should be for this asset when it hits game. So I already know this is a small object, and I'm running my equation that I've talked about in the previous chapter. I'm just going to cover really fast. A 512 represents 8 feet worth of information. 8 feet equals 2.4384 meters. That's 64 pixels per foot. That's the textile density that Republic has established, and that's the textile density we're trying to hit for this, this demo. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to drop it down to a 128. This is a very small object, and I think a 128 should be sufficient. It might be overly sufficient. So here's our UVs. I'm going to scale this down so we can actually see what happens to the UVs. Pull over here. And then let's just go ahead and look at this texture real fast. I mean, you can see we have a lot of very nice detail in here. I mean, obviously this is ripped from a high-res object, and it looks very nice. It looks very well done. But is it the correct resolution? Probably not. So let's just go down here, and I have it set to 128, and let's just run this, uh, uh, this plugin. So I'm going to right-click on this, right-click again, instantiates the script, and you can already see something change. It looks like the UVs might have scaled down a little bit, which they did. So this would even indicate that a 128 for this object is too large. So next thing is, let's drop it down to 64. And by 64, there we go. And let's run this script again. Let's get a right click. And there we go. We're already starting to get some of the detail back to where it used to be. Let's open this up. And there you go. I mean, this isn't exact by any means. You might, you might be thinking to yourself, well, you just destroyed your UVs. Well, no, that's not what that's meant for. All I'm doing right now is I'm trying to establish what size texture should I be clamping my texture to when it hits Unity. So this would tell me, even though some of the UVs are outside the 0 to 1, that this more than likely should be a 64 by 64 texture. And what I mean should be is because this camera more than likely, let's go ahead and uh, delete this. When you see it on screen, it's going to be about that big. Do you actually think you're going to see any loss of information on this camera when it's this size? You're not. That's one more reason to establish a text density. I mean, that texture could have easily been a 512 when it could have been a 64 by 64. That's a lot of memory overhead for such a small prop. Let's work our way down the chain. Now we have a blanket here. Does this blanket look correct? Well, considering it's about the same size as the camera, I'd say probably not, unless this, of course, is like a child's blanket. Um, but because I already know this was blanket authored to be the blanket for Hope, our protagonist, I'm going to scale it up until I think it's about right. And let's look at our scale. This is about, uh, I mean, it's 80% larger than it used to be because it was 100% before. So let's go ahead and keep pivot, fix the transforms. Now it's 100%. And now let's figure out how large should this texture be to be correctly authored. Let's open up our UVs again. I'm going to shrink it down. There we go, and I'm going to guess maybe this is a 256. We're going to run the operation again on this object, hit it one more time. It's going to cycle, and let's look at our UVs. So that's actually not too bad. I mean, that's pretty close. This is still more resolution than we're supposed to have, but this might be the benchmark we're shooting for this because I always allow the artists, as they're working, to have about a 15% nudge in either direction. And you do that because it's almost impossible to hit 100% texel density all the time. It's very difficult to do that. So you allow them to scale their UVs up or down about 15% to stay within that threshold. But let's just verify. Let's do uh, 128 now. 
run the process again and see how much larger these UVs are. And that's considerable. I mean, we've lost a lot of resolution here. Um, if I go to element mode, move these out of the way. I mean, look at that. This, these are clearly outside the zero to one. Whereas with the camera, they weren't that bad. So in this case, I would actually clamp this texture at 256, regardless of what size I've authored it at. That way I'm using the sufficient amount of memory and I'm hitting my texel density. All right, so let's delete that. And let's go to the chair. Is the chair the correct size in relationship to Hope? Um, I'd say probably not. It's a little too small in my opinion. So let's go ahead and scale this up a little bit. That's uh, a little bit better, a little bit more. I think that feels about right. You have to kind of eyeball a lot, of, a lot of this stuff and just guess how large it should be. But I'm going to say, at least for this demo, this is the correct size. So once again, we're going to reset and we're 30%, roughly 30% more than we used to be. I'm going to go ahead and reset my transforms, fix the pivot. We're at zero again. And let's open up our UVs. Let's get this down one more time. And because this was a 256, I'm going to go ahead and try a 512 for this one. So right click, right click again, it's processing. And I didn't see much of a change. That might indicate that the UVs didn't shift a whole lot. So once again, the 512 appears to be more resolution than we need, but is it too much resolution? Like if I go down to a 256, is this gonna be too little? Let's find out. It's processing, let's open this up. And yeah, absolutely. So in this case, we're kind of, we're right in the middle. Um, you have to be diligent about trying to figure out what is the best practice for this. And considering the amount of space we're using and the amount of the UVs that are actually outside of the zero to one at this point, I would actually suggest having a 512 for this uh, chair at the end of the day. So delete that, remove this modifier. And now I know that the camera to be the correct resolution, once I get into game should be clamped to 64 the blanket should be clamped to a 256, and the chair should be clamped to a 512. Well, we figured out the texel density for these assets. Why don't we go into Unity and start clamping some textures? So the first thing I'm gonna do is copy this name. Get out of here, go into Unity. And because we have consistent naming conventions, I'm gonna paste this in here, and very quickly I have my texture. Let's open up the inspector and see what resolution it's clamped to. Well, this actually isn't clamped at all. It's a 1024. That's how, what the original texture size would be. To get this to be the correct resolution, we've already established this has to be a 64 by 64 texture. So I'm just gonna set these values real fast on all the pertinent devices. Default should be 64, hit apply. And there we go. We have our camera. It should be the correct resolution now. And let's go look at it. It's pretty blurry up close, granted, but once you get far enough away, based off of how large you're gonna see it on screen, this actually looks pretty correct. I'd say this looks very accurate. You're not gonna notice a whole lot of resolution issues at this size, unless of course it becomes a hero object, which means you're gonna see it up close. If that does happen, which it very well can, at that point in time, you'd then allow this texture to be clamped at a slightly higher resolution. Let's see, 128, does it hold up? Uh, maybe a 256. And there we go. I'd say that's more than appropriate for a cinematic camera. You're never going to get much larger than this on an iPhone or iPad, so this would be appropriate for a cinematic. But for consistent texel density, this would actually be 64 pixels by 64 pixels. It's a harsh reality, but if you're going to be saving memory, this is what you have to be doing. And you do this for all your assets. So in the next uh, demonstration we're going to have, I'm going to be showing you how to get consistent texel density from a variety of props that you'd use to create for an entire world. I'm going to probably be focusing on intelligentsia props in this case. So stay tuned, and we're going to dig a little bit deeper.